Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, howdy. Hey, it's uh, great to be back at Faith Bridge for a second week in a row. My name is Timothy Atik. I'm the director of Breakaway Ministries and College Station. I love this church. I'm so thankful for the part that this church has played in my life and in Breakaway's history uh, over the years. Well, a little less than four weeks ago, I went to bed at about 11.30 p.m., and then my wife woke me up by turning every light on in the room And she woke me up to basically tell me something doesn't feel right. And uh, I took my sweet love and time getting out of bed simply because she didn't say the magic words. The magic words were not, please get out of bed. The magic words would have been, I'm going into labor. All right. (laughs) She didn't use those words. She just simply said something doesn't feel right. So in my expert opinion, the best thing to do is to go back to sleep until you're sure (laughs) that this thing's happening. Well... We got to the hospital at 1.50 a.m., and by 6.28 a.m., Jake Robinson Atik had arrived. And so we've, we've expanded our family, and uh, man, that, that morning was just such a significant moment in, uh, in our family, and uh, it was just a sweet time of celebrating new life. Like, I will never forget, you know, Jake uh, being put on to Catherine, and then we were just given time to, to be together, just the three of us, and it was just a sweet time celebrating new life, and for like the first five minutes that he was with us, I was just choking back tears and the reason that I chug back the tears and just, instead of just letting them come out is because I'm a really ugly crier, all right? <laughs> like, none of the nurses would have seen me and been like, oh, that's so sweet. They would have been like, that's unfortunate, you know? Like, that's... <laughs> so, I chugged back the tears, but uh, it was just a sweet time of celebrating new life, and family came to town, and And now for almost four weeks, we've been celebrating the life of Jake. And even if you catch me afterward, I'll probably show you a picture, even if you don't ask to see one, because um, new life is always worthy of celebration. And one of the reasons that I tell you that is is simply because when when you read the scriptures, when someone gives their life to Jesus Christ, like when someone comes to a place where they recognize Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the the scriptures would refer to that as being born again or coming to life spiritually. And if you were to read chapters like Luke 15, you would see that when someone comes to life spiritually, the, the heavens erupt with celebration because new life spiritually is worthy of celebration. And I think that we get that. Like, I think that we understand that. We watch the baptism video, and we, we hear these, these little kids articulate the fact that they have come to life spiritually, and something in us loves that. We get excited about that. It stirs something inside of us. And I think that the reason that, that new spiritual life is, is so exciting is because someone's story has changed. Their story has changed and their story becomes, I was dead and now I'm alive. That's their story. That's our story. Maybe you're here this morning and you wouldn't consider yourself a Christian, but this morning God's in a sense going to turn the lights on for you. And you're going to see Jesus clearly for the first time and walking out of this place, your story will have changed. Your story will be, I was dead, and now I'm alive. So when you go to lunch and you meet up with some friends and they were like, how's your morning going? You can simply say, well, I was dead and now I'm alive. So it's been a pretty good morning. What have you been doing? (laughs) Man, new life is, is worthy of celebration. But I think about the fact that at least with, uh, with us regarding the birth of, of Jake, we didn't just show up to the hospital and a baby popped out. No, there was this four-hour period known as labor 
that my wife would consider the most pain she's ever been in in her life. I was a huge support during that four hours, and so I should be celebrated as well for that time. But anyway, <laughs> I, I firmly believe that we have Jake because God has given him to us as a gift. And I think that it's solely because God allowed us to get pregnant, and it's because God sustained that baby in the womb that we have them, that, that's why we have them. Yet at the same time, God gave my wife specifically a role to play in the physical birth of our son, Jake. And I think the, the same is true spiritually. Nobody becomes a Christian without something miraculous happening. Like God has to awaken something inside of a person. He has to give, give someone the ability to see him clearly so that they can freely respond to God in faith. Yet at the same time, when you read Matthew chapter nine, you hear Jesus saying, hey, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So it's as if God is saying, hey, you know what? No one can come to faith without me doing a miraculous work. Yet at the same time, God gives us each unique roles to play, significant roles to play in the spiritual births of people in this world. I believe that many of us are missing out on the joy that comes from being used by God for new life. Like we believe in Jesus and we want others to believe in Jesus, yet we don't tell anyone about Jesus. I'll just tell you this, I am so glad that no one was videotaping me when I was in the delivery room. Because there was this period of time, uh, just this really awkward period of time where uh, I didn't wanna stand right next to my wife uh, by the bed because I didn't wanna get in the way of the nurses or the doctor, but then I didn't wanna stand too far away because I didn't want my wife to feel like I was unengaged or didn't really care. And so what ended up happening was there was this period of time where I literally stood in the middle of the delivery room awkwardly and silently doing nothing. I needed some direction. I needed someone to tell me what to do. And I wonder if the same is true spiritually that some of us just simply need some direction to get in the game. Francis Chan says this in his book, Crazy Love. He says, the point of your life is to point people to Christ. I hope that that resonates with you a little because what I'm telling you is the point of your life. I'm, I'm helping you realize the point and purpose of your existence. You matter, you have purpose, you have a reason for waking up and breathing this morning. The point of your life is to point people to Christ. And so this morning, what I hope you can do is I hope you can leave this place and take a step into the point and purpose of your life. In order to do that though, you need to be clear on four things. There's four things that we need to get our hearts and minds around when it comes to engaging those who do not know Jesus Christ. We need to be clear on our mentality, our message, our mission, and our motivation when it comes to engaging those who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're gonna get those four M's from studying 2 Corinthians chapter five. So if you have a Bible, turn with me this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter five. Let me go ahead and read us. 2 Corinthians chapter five, verse 16, all the way through chapter six, verse two. The Apostle Paul says this, he says, from now on, therefore we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, 
be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If the point of our lives is to point people to Christ, then we need to start by being clear on our mentality when it comes to engaging with those who do not know Jesus Christ. Paul's mentality had to shift, and we see that shift in verse 16. He says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. What you need to realize is before Paul became a Christian, he was a Pharisee. He was a devout Jew. And according to Jewish tradition, Paul would have really been forbidden from engaging with unbelieving Gentiles or non-Jews. So he would have spent his life avoiding Gentiles or non-Jews. Paul spent the majority of his life before becoming a Christian judging people by their external appearance. He would view people through the lens of their ethnicity. But when he became a Christian, a shift in his mentality occurred. Instead of avoiding Gentiles, he began pursuing Gentiles. Instead of viewing people through a physical lens, he began to view them through a spiritual lens. And if we want to be effective for the kingdom of God, there has to be a shift in our mentality. I believe that there are four shifts that have to to take place. The first shift is this. We have to come to a place where we realize that being cocooned in a Christian bubble is unhealthy. See, it is possible for us to order our time and days in such a way that we are constantly surrounded by Christians, that we never spend any meaningful time with those who don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we can come to church on Sundays, and then we can have different Bible studies throughout the week, and the people that we get lunch with are all Christians, people that we know from church or different kind of associations. Then if we get together with people, it's always with people that have a relationship with Jesus Christ. When we cocoon ourselves inside of a Christian bubble, we have to realize that we simply become a sponge. If you think about a sponge, a sponge soaks up water, but sponges are always meant to be wrung out. What happens to a sponge when it simply soaks up water and then sits? It becomes a block of bacteria. It becomes... Mold and mildew begin to grow. And the same can be true of a believer in Jesus Christ who is cocooned in a Christian bubble. See, sponges are meant to be wrung out, and so are you. We come to places like this to get filled up so that we can go out and be wrung out for the sake of the gospel. If you are cocooned in a Christian bubble, then your life certainly is out of sync with the life of Jesus Christ. Why did the Pharisees have a problem with Jesus? Because he ate meals and reclined at tables with sinners and tax collectors. So if we just look at the life of Jesus Christ, then here's what we can conclude. If you don't have any friends that don't know Jesus Christ, you need to get some. And if you don't spend any meaningful time with those who don't know Jesus Christ, you need to change your schedule. The second key shift that has to happen in our mentality is this. We have to begin to look past people's sin to their need. We have to look past people's sin to their need. We should never be surprised when people who don't follow Jesus don't look like Jesus. That should never surprise us when people who don't follow Jesus don't look like Jesus. We should never be surprised when simple, sinful people sin. We have to realize that more often than not, the visible is, is usually just a symptom of the spiritual. 
The visible is always just a symptom of the spiritual. So if you're looking at someone's life, if you're looking at their their promiscuity or their lack of character or their language or uh, their addictions that are causing all sorts of brokenness in their lives, you should never be surprised by that. But you have to train your eyes to look past that. You have to look past their sin to their need. Here's what you have to realize. When all you do is see people for their sin, you will withdraw from them and judge them. But when you look past people's sin to their need, you know what you will do? You will move toward them in compassion with the hope of Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus is our example. Matthew 9, 36 says this about Jesus. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The third shift that has to happen in our mentality is this, it's never an us versus them thing. People who do not know Jesus Christ, people who are even hostile towards Christianity are never our enemy. They're never our enemies. I want you to know that that the staff that I work with at Breakaway We pray almost every week that we would have people from other religions at Breakaway, and we pray that people from the atheist and agnostic society on A&M's campus would be at Breakaway. We, We would love the privilege of welcoming them because they are not our enemy. People who don't know Jesus and people who are hostile toward Jesus are not our enemy. They are actually captives of our one true enemy. And so our goal isn't to war against them, Our goal is to move toward them in love and engage with them, seek to understand them in hopes of one day sharing with them the good news of Jesus Christ. The last shift that has to take place in our mentality is simply this, with God, the impossible is always possible. That means that no one is too far gone. There's no one in this world whose heart Jesus cannot change. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's no unlikelies. Don't ever find yourself in a position where you say, that person probably will never come to faith in Jesus Christ. Hey, you need to know the only reason that you're a Christian is because God turned the lights on for you and awakened something in you that gave you the ability to see him clearly and respond freely to him. It's not that you were born with some spiritual inclination toward him. So if God changed your heart, surely he can change anyone's heart. You know what this means? It means don't stop praying for people. Don't stop pursuing people. Don't stop inviting people. Don't ever stop inviting people to church. Some of y'all need to start inviting people to church, but if you're inviting people to church, never stop inviting someone. Because who knows, maybe they've told you now 50 times, who knows what God is doing in their heart today that would tee them up to give you your first yes. Be faithful. We have to be clear on our mentality. We have to be clear on our mentality. Number two, if the point of our lives is to point people to Christ, then we have to be clear on our message. This is simply answering the question, why is Jesus Christ worth it? We have a great answer for that question. We have a phenomenal answer for the question, why is Jesus Christ worth it? Paul gives it to us in multiple verses. We'll start with verse 17. He says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. This is amazing. I wonder if anyone here this morning is looking for a fresh start. What you need to know is with Jesus Christ, you no longer have to be defined by your past. Whatever it is in your life that's prompting feelings of guilt, shame, and regret are done away with by Jesus Christ. Whatever it is for you, whether it's some addiction or broken relationship or an abortion, Jesus Christ has dealt with it. Colossians chapter 2 says that he has taken it away, having nailed it to the tree. This is what Jesus Christ has done for us. 
He's in the business of taking our story of failure and trading it for his story of forgiveness. This is good news, but, but that's not all our message is. Verse 18, Paul says, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. This, this Greek word that has been translated reconciliation really emphasizes two things. It first emphasizes a distinct change, and then the second thing it emphasizes is being brought into favor. So this is what makes Christianity so beautiful, is is when you know Jesus Christ, a distinct change happens in your relationship with him. See, before you know Jesus Christ, you're considered an enemy of God, a, a, a child of wrath. But when you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're no longer a child of wrath, you're a child of God. There's a, there's a distinct change in your relationship with God. And so now, because of this distinct change, you've actually been brought into favor. The God of the universe looks at you and calls you his son or his daughter. And this has everything to do now with how God feels about you. I want you to just think about this right now, in this moment, where you're at in life, how do you think God feels about you this morning? If you were to be honest with yourself, I wonder if if there are some people in here who would just sense that God is disappointed in them. I wonder if that's where you're at this morning, if you would would feel that God is, is disappointed in you. But Jesus Christ has changed our relationship with God. He's brought us into the family. We're no longer children of wrath. We're we're children of God. I'll I'll position it this way. We've had Jake in our home for a little less than four weeks. And in those four weeks, Jake has done nothing for us. (laughs) Well, let me tell you what he has done. He has peed on my wall. He has cost us money. He has caused us to lose a lot of sleep. He has a fussy period every day where where you basically can do nothing to pacify crying. Um, and And he sleeps the majority of the time. Like he's done nothing for us. And yet every single day I look at him and I find my soul welling up with joy and delight in the fact that he's my son. And even though he doesn't get it, I take him in my arms every single day and I look at him and I tell him, I love you and I'm proud you're my son. Would you allow yourself this morning to sense the God of the universe doing that with you? It doesn't matter where you're at. Even if you're in the midst of a mess right now, even in the midst of a fussy time in your life, even in the midst of you being asleep to his presence more than he would like for you to be, would you sense the God of the universe looking at you and telling you, I love you and I am so proud that you're my child this morning? Some of y'all will look and just say, that ju- that's not possible. I just can't, I can't embrace that and I can't accept that. How is that even possible? Well, Paul tells us how that's possible in verse 21. He says, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We actually talked about this verse last week. This is considered the great exchange. Jesus got all of our sin, all of our failure. And in in turn, through faith, we have been recipients of his perfection. His perfection has been credited to our account. So now when God sees us, he no longer sees us, he sees Jesus Christ. All of the love that he has now for Jesus, he has for us. So just think about that. All of the love, delight, and pleasure, and joy that God the Father has in Jesus Christ he now has in you because you are in 
Christ Jesus. This is life-changing news. This is an eternity-shaping message. This is our message. This is what makes Christianity different than every other religion. Every other religion says, here's what you need to do to be good enough for God. Christianity says, there's nothing you can do to be good enough for God, and that's okay. Jesus Christ has come and been good enough for you. This is what makes Christianity is so different. This is our message. We have to be clear on our message. Let me just ask you real quick, will you close your eyes real quick? And what I want you to do as you close your eyes is I, I want you to picture the spheres of influence that God has placed you in, whether it's in your neighborhood or it, at your specific workplace or um, coaching your kid's sports team. Just think about your sphere of influence and think about the people that are in that sphere of influence. And I just want you to think, is there anyone in your life right now that you know that could really benefit from a new start from Jesus Christ? Is there anyone that comes to mind that is bitter or angry that could benefit from our perfect Father in heaven calling them his son or daughter? Is there anyone you know from a different religion that's trying to earn their way to God that could experience the release and the freedom that comes from not having to be good enough for God because Jesus Christ has already been good enough for them? You can open up your eyes. This is our message. A life-changing, in eternity-shaping message. We're clear on our mentality. We're clear on our me message. Now let's be clear on our mission. Paul spells it out for us in verse 20. He says this, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Paul tells us our mission in life. Your mission is to be God's ambassador. What's an ambassador? You guys know this. It's a representative from one country to another. God, in a sense, says, you know what? I have all the power in the world. I have all the creativity in the world. I have all the wisdom in the world, and yet I have chosen to change the world through you. God says, I want you to represent me. I want you to speak for me. So when you open your mouth with people, you're actually opening my mouth. I want to speak through you. I want to change people's lives through you. I want to do something supernatural through you. And the reason that this is so important for us to grasp is because deep down inside of us, we all want to know that we matter. We all want to know that we're making a difference. We all want to know that we're significant. We all want to know that we're significant. Every single one of us fears being a nobody. Let me just ask you this. What job title could you get here on earth? I mean, what could show up on your LinkedIn profile that would be more significant than being an ambassador for the Lord of Lords and King of Kings? I mean, seriously, let that just put things in perspective. This is an invitation from the God of the universe to be a part of something bigger than yourself. This is an invitation to have your hands in that which is eternal. This is an invitation from God to do supernatural things. A few years ago, I, um, I asked my creative director to do something with the movie Taken. I don't know if you remember the movie Taken, but it was basically a movie about a dad whose daughter was, uh, was abducted and put into the slave trade, and so her, her dad goes after her, and basically his, his job description in life is, is to jack people up for a living, is kind of what this guy does. And so he goes after his daughter, and he gets his daughter. But what I asked my creative d director to do was to remove all of the drama and all of the rescue from the movie. 
So I just said, I just want you to like put together the clips of the movie that don't involve any drama or any rescue. And so here's what we saw. We saw this dad take his daughter to the airport. This girl got on a plane, went to Europe with her friend, and then the daughter came home. That was it. That was the movie. (laughs) What kind of movie is that? The rescue is what made the movie, right? Here's the interesting thing. Every day, we watch people get up, go to work, eat lunch, eat dinner, and go home. Every day, we watch people get up, go to the gym, go about their business, and we remove from their story their need for rescue. But there's a reason why we resonate with Brian Mills in Taken when he hugs his daughter for the first time at the end of the movie. There's a reason why something in us thinks it's so incredible when those three seals take out those three Somalian pirates and save Captain Phillips in a split second. It's because we resonate with rescue because that's what Jesus Christ has done for us. He has come to earth to rescue us back into the arms of the Father. But not just that. He wants to make us agents of rescue. And we want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. This is our opportunity to do it. This is our mission. We are ambassadors for Christ. So now let's be clear on our motivation. Our motivation is found in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 6. Paul says this, working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Paul is saying today, The gospel is moving. Today, God is working. Today, the gospel is winning. This is our motivation, that today is the day of salvation. Today, the gospel is winning. Let me just, let let me give you a visual to help you really grasp this. There's an organization called Global Media Outreach that has put the gospel on the internet in different forms. And so you can actually go to their website and you can see this map and And you can watch this map and it'll just load in real time. We actually captured video of this. This is showing you what was going on yesterday, somewhere around this time. But if you see the blue pin pop around on the map, that is showing people experiencing or visiting the gospel. And so this was just yesterday. At that point in the day, 109,000 people had come across the gospel. If you see an orange pin drop, that's somebody indicating a decision for Christ. Just at that point in the day, 12,000 people. Isn't that incredible? This is just on the internet. This is the gospel winning. Let me just unpack for you What's really going on in the world? There's an organization called The Traveling Team which published an article documenting the growth of the church. And here's what I read from The Traveling Team. Don't miss these. The number of people who are being presented the gospel every day is now at least 260,000. Every day, the average number of people who convert to Christianity worldwide averages 174,000 people. In 1975, there were estimated about 2.7 million evangelical Christians in China. Today, people estimate that there are somewhere between 80 and 100 million Christians in China. People project that in 15 years or less, China will have more Christians than the United States does. On average, there are over 30,000 conversions in China every day. In Nepal, the world's only official Hindu country, over 100,000 Hindus have met Jesus in the last two decades. 
Every month, another 15,000 in India are baptized as new believers. In Africa, there are over 25,000 new believers every day. In Buenos Aires, Argentina, one church attracts 225,000 people each week. Services take place, get this, services take place daily in a converted movie theater from 9 a.m. to midnight. In each month, about 3,000 new believers are baptized. In 1900, Korea had no Protestant church and it was deemed impossible to penetrate. Today, six new churches open every day in South Korea. It's the site of nine of the world's largest churches, some with more than 800,000 members. Today, Korea is 30% Christian. Millions of Buddhists have come to Christ. The gospel is winning. Yet there's still so much left to be done. There is still so much left to be done. The, the IMB, the International Mission Board, estimates that there are about 11,741 distinct people groups in our world. Almost 3,200 of these people groups are considered unengaged, unreached people groups, meaning that there is no intentional strategy to reach them for the sake of Jesus Christ at this point. Let's just talk about the city of Houston. Over six million people in Houston and its surrounding areas. Imagine if every single church in Houston was packed full, like not a seat left. If every church in Houston this morning was filled to the brim, there would still be millions in this city unreached. And the God of the universe is saying, I want to change the world through you. He's inviting us in, saying, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. This is our opportunity to step into something bigger than ourselves. It's our opportunity to have our hands in the eternal. See, Jesus is the one who has set the example for us. Jesus Christ came for us having a mentality of compassion for the helpless, heralding a message of love for the lost, bearing the mission of freedom for the captives, carrying a motivation of hope for the hopeless. All that we are meant to do now, he has done before. We need only follow his example. I'll close by telling you this. I used to live in Waco, and in Waco, if you were to drive around today, you might stumble upon a billboard that's just a black, black billboard with two big words in white lettering, and these are the words, use me. And as I saw that, just those words, use me, the, the thought that I had was, what if that was our prayer? Maybe that's what the prayer of the church needs to be. See, my hope this morning is that you're going to leave here clear on your mentality and, and our message and our, our mission and our motivation. But maybe you're sitting there saying, I don't even know where to start. Well, maybe this is where you start. You start by simply praying a two-worded prayer. God, use me. May my life be a billboard for your greatness and glory. Would you use me to tell the world about you? God, use me. Let's start there this morning. Let's pray together. If that's resonating with you, just in the quietness of your own heart right now, just say those words. Don't, don't let me pray them over you. You pray them yourself. Just say, God, use me. You can even say, I don't know what that even looks like. But I'll, I'll start here. God, use me. God, would you use us? Would you use us would you allow us to be billboards for your greatness and glory? May you use us to tell the world about you, Lord. I pray that you would give us opportunities to engage with those who don't know you, Lord God. 
Pray that you would give us the opportunities this week even to celebrate new spiritual life, Lord God. And we know that 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 can only happen by you doing something miraculous, Lord. Yet, we want to be laborers, Lord. If your harvest is plentiful but your laborers are few, we want to be your laborers, Lord God. We want to be used by you, Lord God. Would you allow us to play a part in the spiritual births of people in this city and all over the world, Lord God? When it comes to missions, we're either going, praying, sending, or disobeying, Lord God. So Lord, we just, we wanna be a part of your work. Your gospel is winning, Lord God. We don't wanna be sitting on the bench. We love you. Use us, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Breakaway Ministries Director, Timothy Atik, who just brought the message, Ambassadors in Christ. Welcome. Thanks. Always a joy to have you back here Always teaching. To and today, back. what a great message. Thanks. Um, yeah, and uh, presented it so well. There's just these four pieces of Um, our role and responsibility as ambassadors in Christ. Um, And so I want to ask something, um, just kind of like both sides of what you talked about, about entering into people's lives. So the first question I wanted to ask is, um, so where do you draw the line on being friends of sinners or feeling or feeling like you're enabling your sin or participating in their sin of how how does that look? How does how can that look? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I think it'll look different for each person. I think I have to start by saying, you know, you need to know your own mm-hmm. tendencies well, really well. Mm-hmm. That might mean that you don't go certain places or do certain things with, with people just because it will lead you into temptation. Mm-hmm. And so please hear me say that from the beginning. But... Um, you know, I think the goal is to engage with people in a way where you be true to who you are. So that means that you might, um, you, you never compromise your standards for the sake of the gospel, but that doesn't mean that you can't be with someone and love them. It might impact where you go with them. That might mm-hmm. mean that you have to, you are the one who schedules the time to say, mm-hmm. hey, let's get lunch. You can control that, whether it's going to lunch or, um, you know, connecting for a workout or something like that, you might control where you guys meet mm-hmm. and what y'all are doing when you meet. Um, but the, but the goal, but the goal is love. And in terms of enabling their sin, um, you know, I think by you being present in your li- mm-hmm. in their lives, you're not, you're not saying that you approve of their mm-hmm. sin. I do think that you don't want to judge them for their sin, yeah. but I think it's to you. You can gently say, "Hey, man, let me let me just encourage you. I see you head in this mm-hmm. direction. Let me just tell you what I've found in my own life mm-hmm. to be true. I'm on this very imperfect journey, but I've found life elsewhere. I don't mm-hmm. know if that makes sense. It does. But- it does. One uh, things that I've found helpful is being able to say, like. I struggled with this yeah. same thing that you're struggling yeah. with, and here's yeah. what I've found to help yeah. me bring freedom or yeah. to help me bring hope. Um, yeah. And just, uh, I think you can easily approach this question of like, oh, I'm the Christian, you're the sinner, but we're all the sinner. Yeah. No, <laughs> we, all all the same, yeah, we, we all have the same. Together, yeah, we all have the same seat at the table. Yeah. We're all broken. Yeah. Um, and using what God has done in our brokenness to, That's right. to talk That's to people. That's always a bridge. Um, so let me ask you about the other side because uh, I have found myself in this situation actually uh, when I was first being discipled. Um, someone pointed out to me this thing that I had in my life, which is I've only surrounded myself with Christian friends. Yeah. Uh, I have built this bubble around yeah. myself. Um, and uh, so what do you do when you find yourself in that situation? What's some steps you can take to begin expanding yeah. your circles? Well, I think the word is intentionality. Mm-hmm. That 
something is going to have to change in order for you to get around people who don't know the Lord. So mm -hmm. you can't leave church today and, and just hope that you stumble into it, okay? But there are easy things that you can do to, there's easy changes you can make. For example, um, have a normal lunch spot. Like if you go out to lunch every day, go to the same two or three places and get to know the wait staff. Mm -hmm. Ask to sit in someone's section. Ask if they're working. You know, I try it when I go to a restaurant, I try and ask the person for their name to get to know their name, mm -hmm. even ask a little bit about their story. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good place to start. It and might mean that you, uh, you know, you go work out at a certain place or you get involved in a group of people uh, working out um, to do that. It might just be as much as, you know, if your kids play sports, mm -hmm. instead of standing on the sidelines with mm -hmm. just you and your mm -hmm. spouse and being like, I don't want to engage with anyone, yeah. you make it a goal to say, you know what, I'm going to introduce myself to the person sitting next to me and just and talk to them. Yeah. If there are neighbors that whose names you still don't know on your street, man, that is it. Mm -hmm. There you go. You start there. Mm -hmm. You go knock on the door and say, you know what, it's crazy. We have lived next to each other for three years. I just, I figured it's about time for us to meet. Mm -hmm. And so that I would just take those steps. Start with your street. Yeah, Who do really you need good. to engage with on your street? Start with your normal routines. If you can change it, and that means you start eating at the same place. You might get tired of the food, but you know what? You're not there for the food. You're there for the, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's really good. Uh, one exercise that uh he had our whole team do was sort of walk through your day, where you go, who you interact yeah. with. And I was like, oh, I see the same people at the dry cleaner yep. two or three times That's a week right. dropping off and picking up my, yep. I know their names. I'm beginning to know their stories. Like I get my hair cut by the same person. Like there are places where like that conversation could be a lot more intentional yep. than I've ever, it's than a, I've ever made it's it. It's always mm -hmm. line yourself up with the, with the same people. So it might, might mean you, you use the same repair companies so that mm -hmm. you can interact with the, same people. You get your hair cut from the same person mm -hmm. so that you can, I mean, that I've had two great opportunities over the years mm -hmm. to share the gospel with people who cut my hair, the person who cut my hair in Austin, the person who cut my hair in Waco. Mm -hmm. I've had that opportunity. And so it's just increasing visibility with the same person because over time you can build that relationship. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, okay, so here's the last question. And I, and I bet a lot of people probably were like motivated. Yes, this is right. This is true. I want to do this. I'm called to do this. But how do I do it? Yeah. How do I tell other people about Jesus? Like, yeah. I don't feel like I have all the answers. Yeah. Uh, how do I? I definitely don't have all <laughs> the answers. I'll tell you, it is much easier to get into a spiritual conversation than you would ever think. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just rattle off a few things. They're in no order, but um, in terms of questions that you could ask anyone at any time, starting with your waiter or waitress at lunch, like for example, a question that a friend gave me that I've started asking people is this, is, is I, I did this with, uh, with the air conditioning guy not long ago, but I'll just say, hey man, um, prayer is something that's really important to me. Let me just ask you real quick, is there anything you or your family needs that I could ask God to help you with mm -hmm. today? That's good. And I, I've only had one person in all the time who just waved me up and said, mm -hmm. no thanks. That's because I walked up to him on a beach and he was probably like, you're invading yeah, my wasn't. personal space. But for the most part, <laughs> usually when it's coupled with a friendly interaction, people are like, it's been interesting how people have opened up and said, this is going on. And if someone says, no, I'm good, then say, man, then when I leave here, I'm just going to pray and thank God that everything's going well in your life. Mm -hmm. that, that might feel too forward for you. So if that feels too forward, then another question you can simply ask is, hey, let me just, if you know, we've known each other for a long time. Let me ask you, we've never talked about this, but do you have a faith? And to just ask that question, do you have a faith? Mm -hmm. And I think you'd be surprised how many people, you're not, you're not saying, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord? <laughs> you're just saying, hey, tell me about your life. It's mm -hmm. you're expressing interest mm -hmm. in who they are as a person. Yeah. And I think you'd be surprised how many people are interested in opening up. I think, um, I think I would ask one of those two questions. And then the third thing that I would tell you is the best thing you can do is be 
be honest about who you are and how God has changed your life. So if, if God has done something for you, don't shy away from bringing up God in the conversation. Like just the other day, I was sitting with some architects and I was talking about, you know, God has given us this opportunity. I don't know if they're Christians or mm -hmm. not, but it doesn't matter. This is what God has done in my life. I don't need to, to hide that because of who these people might be. So don't be afraid to give God credit where credit is due and then know how to share your story in, mm -hmm. in a minute or less. Mm -hmm in different forms to say, you know what, you know what, Harvey hit and our home was flooded and you know what, that was a defining moment in our lives and God really showed up and you know what, one of the ways that God really showed up in our lives is He put around people, put people in our lives mm -hmm. who, who loved us and cared for us in the name of Jesus. You know what, someone can choose how they want to respond to that, mm -hmm. but you're not forcing anything yeah. upon them, you're just testifying to what God has done in your own life. So be true to that. That's and I good. guarantee you, it will, out of that, you can say, hey, well, you know, I, obviously you can see God's something that's important to me. Tell me, do you have a faith? And you know what? The most awkward part is the first 15 seconds. Yeah. And the, the other 30 minutes of the conversation are it's nothing but joy. It's a real normal life yeah. conversation. Yeah. Um, I think what you, the, the key pieces that you kind of let out are important because I, grew up in the church and I feel like I felt like this was like like a speech I had to give or yeah. like the five points or like the three things and I had to like hit all these things and then as I matured and I've grown years ago when I started sort of making this corner I was like oh it's just asking people questions yeah. it's just getting it's to just know them no, it's just sharing my yeah. sharing my own story these are things that I can do and say in, yeah. from my own experience um, and so knowing you know being able to verbalize your story asking questions are all great people places are giving to you started. signs they want you, you to ask them a question someone has a mm -hmm. tattoo that's visible it's because they, they want, want you, you to, to ask, ask. them mm -hmm. tell me about your tattoo people will wear shirts that beg the Why what is that about yeah. you know what I'm saying so mm -hmm. it's people want to be asked questions that are deeper than than surface level mm -hmm. You know, so. Yep, and, and I've learned the more you do it. Yeah. The more you put yourself right. out there, the more intentional you are, the more comfortable you get to where you're not even thinking about it when you encounter people. Yeah, you're, and you're right. generally interested in knowing yeah. them. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, great just message for us to just be out yeah. and be engaged in people's lives. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah. Appreciate you being yeah. here. You and thank you for joining us for PostScript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for PostScript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.